Uh, so I got up at 6 this morning. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah. I'm not an ordinary 6 o'clock waker-upper, so it'll take me a little while to stretch my wings into the day. Um, but I'm really looking forward to meeting you all. My name is Adrienne Wong. I'm one of the Spiderweb Show people. Um, I have a title, but I don't like it, so I'm not going to say it out loud. We did change it. I'm the artistic producer. Thank you. So uh, my, my, I get the pleasure this morning of uh, acknowledging the land that we're on today and to let you know that the venues for our gathering today and this week are situated on the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. The Huron-Wendat also claim traditional connection to these lands. And I want to take a moment right now to ask you to share the gratitude that I feel to be here to live, to work, to play, and to learn in this beautiful place. So land acknowledgement is a disruption. It's a time to consider the history of these lands and waterways that we are so privileged to gather on today. And since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, I'd also like to take a moment to consider the legacies of colonization embedded within these technologies, these structures, and these ways of thinking that we use every day. So we're using equipment and high-speed internet that's not available in many indigenous communities across Canada, and I'm sure the United States as well. I'm gonna ask you to take that first page. And many of us have traveled here from other places, burning fuels and consuming resources. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art that we're going to talk about leave significant carbon footprints that contribute to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. So I join, I, I invite you to join me in acknowledging all of this as well as the shared responsibility that it holds, which is to make best use of our time here together. And for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Wheeler, and I'm the artistic director of Spiderweb Show. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here today to the Digital Plus Performance Convening at the Isabel Bader Center for the Performing Arts uh, as the lead up to the Festival of Live Digital Art. Uh, it's so incredible to have everyone here, and, and I feel like it is most certainly a watershed moment for our organization uh, to have all of you here today. So many incredible minds that are working on so many of the things that we've been thinking about gathered together in one space is an incredible opportunity. And, uh, you know, I just think it uh, bodes mm, mentioning that uh, I feel personally uh, that uh, the art of live performance is changing radically as these new tools and these new opportunities not, aren't just... Uh, part of the medium, but they're actually changing our lives and that human experience is changing uh, as these tools become available. And you know, the really kind of simple example is that a uh, recent statistic that 80% of us check our cell phone before we brush our teeth in the morning. And so there's so many just little ways that, that our lives are changing. And so uh, art should reflect what human experience is. And so I'm very um, excited to talk about these ideas with people who have also been looking into this from across North America. Um, I also have to say that I'm just so proud to be partnering with HowlRound. Uh, there are so many almost strange serendipities between our organizations. We, we almost have a doppelganger between each organization and each role, which, and you can guess throughout the day which, who's the witch of HowlRound and Spiderweb show. Um, <laughs> It's true, it's true. Uh, but also, um, to say that this that we've been partnering with HowlRound since our organization um, began. We, we live streamed an event uh, with the help of Vijay about five years ago. Uh, and so um, working with HowlRound has really been embedded in the DNA of what the organization is. And so this seems a very organic outcome of that. And so thank you to everyone from the HowlRound team here. Um, 
I also felt like, uh, hey, there's a lot of people here who have no idea what Spiderweb Show is. I should maybe get into that a little bit so you know what you're dealing with. Uh, so Spiderweb Show uh, 101. We began um, uh, as the answer to a dramaturgical question, which was, uh, what is the state of Canadian theater now? And we tried to answer that with a website at spiderwebshow.ca. Uh, that became an impossible task because, uh, well, you can imagine a number of reasons why, but not the least of which is that now, and then it's now, and then it's now. So you can never actually know what the state of anything is in the, in the present sense. Um, we expanded to be a national organization supported by New World Theatre in uh, Vancouver, Alberta Theatre Projects in Calgary, Praxis Theatre in Toronto, and the National Arts Centre in Ottawa. And we were in kind of an ad hoc organization for about three years. And then we were very fortunate to be offered a residency here at the Isabel Bader Centre in Kingston. And uh, so we incorporated and became our own organization that's based here, uh, generously supported by uh, the Department of Film and Media, the Dance School of uh, Drama and Music, and the Isabel Bader Centre here. And so uh, we feel really fortunate that we've kind of come from being an ad hoc organization to one that's based here in Kingston and looking at these questions. Um, <clears throat> When we moved here, we changed our activities quite a bit. We were mostly publishing things on a website. Uh, now, Spiderweb Show creates work, and we also have this festival that we create. So we're, we're producers and creators also. Uh, and um, the impetus of creating this festival that this leads into is um, we're really obsessed with, with social change and, and, and digital change. And if we really wanted to look at it, we need to bring a critical mass of these types of work together in one place to talk about them. And so this is the second year of Fulda, and it is our intention for this to be an annual festival where people from around the world can come together for four days and look at a lot of different examples of uh, digitally engaged live performance. Um, very briefly, the curatorial model is a bit different. Uh, we curate works in Alpha, Beta, and Go, which is stealing um, pretty deliberately from software development. Uh, and the idea is that to test these works that are digitally engaged, there's an element of interactivity to them. And so they actually have to be tested on audience before they're ready to be open. And so uh, you'll see on the website when you're looking at things, they're all labeled Alpha, Beta, and Go. And so that's to help you know the stage of development that those works are in. Uh, Got to let you know, if you really love us, you can go to folded.ca backslash donate, and we have an opportunity for you to uh, show your uh, love and interest of this event. And uh, I also wanted to let you know about um, something that will be available uh, right here in the Studio Theatre uh, uh, between 1 and 6. We had a residency here with an incredible company called The Electric Company that was here last year, and they created some VR experiences that are complementary to a theatre work. And uh, they're showing up in the afternoon for people to just uh, try them out. And you can sign up on the Slack for that. Just tag at Mariah in the convening Slack. And you can sign up for a slot to uh, experience some of the VR pieces that were uh, in their earliest stages of development here at the festival last year. Um, and then I would be remiss without some thank yous. So thank you very much to the Canada Council for the Arts the Department of Canadian Heritage, uh, the Isabel Bader Center for the Performing Arts, and in particular, Trisha Baldwin, thank you, uh, the Dan School of Drama and Music, and Craig Walker, who is here, the Department of Film and Media at Queen's, the Ontario Arts Council, the City of Kingston, RT09, which is a tourism organization, uh, the Canada's National Arts Center, and I should shout out both uh, the English Theatre and the Interactive Department there that has provided resources, uh, Plank, who, is, uh, uh, who uh, powers our website, and we have an uh, ongoing relationship with Plank, uh, and Toaster Lab. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's so nice to see you all here in real life. Um, my name's Jamie Galoon. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the director and one of four co-founders of HowlRound Theatre Commons. Um, for those who are less familiar, um, HowlRound Theatre Commons is a free and open platform for theatre makers worldwide to connect. Uh, we amplify progressive and disruptive ideas about theatre and performance and facilitate connection between diverse practitioners. Uh, we do this through a number of ways. Um, we are primarily an online space, similar to Spider Web Show, although now that has shifted. Um, and we have an online journal that we publish five times a week. We have a live streaming television network. I should say we are live streaming right now. Um, and we also do convenings like this one. Um, it has been core to our work since the beginning that while we totally love and uh, 
lift up the power of digital to connect us, nothing can replace the power of this um, experience face to face. Um, so I'm really proud to stand here today because this feels like the manifestation of um, a dream that we've had for a long time around trying to foster more uh, international exchange, trying to foster more opportunities for us to have conversations across national borders. Um, so a huge thank you to Spiderweb Show for, for your partnership and ongoing collaboration in this work. We're thrilled to be here. And a huge thank you to all the folks who traveled, um, in many cases, quite a long way to be here. Um, we know that that uh, is not always easy, and we appreciate you spending the time to be here with us today. Um, I would like to thank the National Endowment for the Arts um, for their support of this event in particular. Um, I'd also like to thank the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Barr Foundation, and the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation for their ongoing support of our programs. And I would be remiss without thanking everyone on the HowlRound team who has worked deeply, deeply uh, hard to make this event happen. And I would just ask that folks um, raise your hands as you're able right now if you're part of the HowlRound team. Great, thank you. So we have three goals for our time together today. Um, the first of which is to interrogate. Um, we want to ask, where is digital technology now in the performance landscape? How are we using it? What are the opportunities and challenges therein? And where is it going? The second goal is to demonstrate the value of digital. So we want to explore what's working and its potential. We also are trying in a number of ways to integrate some practical applications into the convening itself. Um, you'll note that we have well, we will, it will be on that screen in a little bit. We have a social wall that's showing any kind of, oh, it is over there. That wall over there is showing any kind of uh, social engagement and we'll be trying to bring in questions throughout the day from folks who are watching along online and to make them a part of the conversation. The third goal of our day is to exchange. Um, to share knowledge, perspectives, approaches, and concrete tools. Um, and also, I think this is such a unique and valuable moment to be able to have this conversation between folks from the US, folks from Canada. You know, there aren't enough, in my opinion, opportunities for these kinds of exchanges to happen. And so it's not lost on me that this, in and of itself, is kind of a huge, <laughs> a, a huge um, opportunity that we have today, is to hear uh, from each other um, in our different perspectives from where we're sitting in our respective um, homes and to be able to not only think about today as um, the beginning and end, but really the start of a conversation, right? Um, we have the opportunity to be here, many of us, through uh, the rest of the festival. So we know that um, you know today is just the start and we're not expecting closure here. I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah. Uh, thanks so much, Jamie. Um, I'm Sarah Garten Stanley, and I'm a co-founder of Spiderweb Show. Uh, and my title I also struggle with, but I, I chose it. It's Creative Catalyst, um, and I'm a festival programmer as well. And I'm so excited uh, to be here uh, with all of you. Uh, obviously, the work with HowlRound has been extremely um, exciting, invigorating, and uh, inspiring. And also, um, for anybody in the um, Spiderweb Show company, Fold a Company, please put your hands up just so people can see you. White t-shirts and orange if you're here. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, I just want to take one moment to say um, that we work as a triangle. Um, Mike Wheeler is the artistic director, myself and Adrian Wong, and we're um, assisted and supported by so many other people. Um, we're really proud of our model, and uh, in some ways I think we also share a, a, a simpatico relationship to how authority and uh, artistic decisions are made with HowlRound, so another way that we're really uh, excited to be partnering. Um, so I've been asked to uh, share the group agreements um, for the day. Um, it was a wonderful process getting to now. We met um, probably weekly, sometimes uh, twice a week, uh, with HowlRound and, uh, and Spiderweb Show to come up with a, today's agenda and to come up with some of these things. Um, behind uh, Jamie, more or less, uh, on the screen, uh, you'll see the agreements. Um, but uh, just to read them out, uh, today we are explorers. Tomorrow we can move to solutions. 
Uh, getting to gather together, as uh, Adrian mentioned in the land acknowledgement, is a privilege, so we hope to make the most of it today and, uh, and throughout the festival. Uh, work towards presence. Um, if you use technology to reach outside the room, please do so in order to bring other people back into the room um, or to use it in ways that help you be more present. Uh, as much as possible, speak from your personal position, from your eye. Uh, employ, this is my final thought, uh, to let the group know that you're finished speaking. Um, this will help obviously overlaps, but also uh, it's, a, it's a much more um, democratic way. And in fact, I learned it from Alex Balmer, who's here in the room at the back, um, as a successful tool to uh, move a conversation forward. So thanks for that, Alex. Um, agree to disagree, never sure about that one. Not sure if I agree. Um, <laughs> Amplify agreement with snapping, sparkle fingers, or emphatic head nodding, or whatever feels necessary. Don't feel you need to take up room to agree again, but do take space and make space, and uh, practice self-care. Take breaks when you need them. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here, and now I'm passing it over to, um, to me still, to talk about <laughs> certain things you may need to know. If you need to get uh, water uh, down at the end of the hallway, there are um, uh, there's a uh, gender um, uh, gender neutral uh, accessible washroom and uh, men and women's washroom, and then at the end of the hallway, quite a ways down, there are other washrooms down way down at the end of the hall. So if you need any help finding those, please um, come to any of us with the orange uh, with the full of the t-shirts on and ask us. Um, if uh, for breaks, the best place on today's day is outside, you're welcome to stay in here. Coffee, juice, um, there will be other refreshments throughout the day, and lunch will also be served here um, at the end of the morning session. I think I've covered all the things I need to cover. Yeah? Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna do a quick rundown of our schedule for the day, which you all have in, the, in Slack in the convening channel. It's also up here um, on the screen. So we are sh very shortly going to move into some uh, group introductions. Um, and then we have our first session, uh, which is digital and performance in the here and now. We'll have a short break. Um, session two, uh, we will be um, connecting with some colleagues in Prague at the Quadrennial, um, also in this space. And then we will move on to lunch. We'll have a third session um, that is from monologue to dialogue. And then we'll have a break, a brief warm up, and close out with our final session. Um, are there any questions at this moment about flow of day, anything we haven't covered that feels um, important? Great. Um, so because we are live streaming, we're going to ask everyone to use a mic anytime you speak. That is both um, so the audio is good for the live stream, but it's also for accessibility in this space. Um, as you can imagine, the acoustics in here, if we didn't have mics, might be a little tricky for some folks. So please be mindful of that. We have three wireless mics. We have a plan to rotate them when we're doing larger group conversations. But uh, thank you for your support and patience with that as we, as we move through the day. Um, yeah, and I guess we already mentioned uh, Twitter, but just to say the hashtag is Folda. So if at any point you feel so moved or want to check out the conversation, that is where to find it. Um, great. And I'm going to pass it over to Adrian and Sarah. Hello again. So this is the point in time when we'll move around the circle to introduce, we've introduced ourselves, we'll introduce ourselves again as a demonstration. Um, but we're going to do this in a timely manner, which will involve a, um, which will involve a timer and then a, <laughs> when your time is up. Now I have no musical theory knowledge. So those of you who do, please don't read anything into the notes that I choose, which I think have meaning, but I don't know what it is. So it's, it's really how I feel in the moment. <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, it, we'll, uh, we'll model what, uh, what we hope is gonna happen. So it's uh, name, pronoun, where you're from. Why did you say yes to the invitation to attend? Uh, what gets you most excited as an artist or a bridger? Uh, and if you have time, before the non-judgmental note is chosen. 
Um, if you have time, uh, this is a one-word game. Digital makes me think of one word. Um, so, Adrian, mm -hmm. uh, would you like to model this? And then I'll follow, and then we'll go to my left. So I won't pass the timer and the glockenspiel. I'll do that, but I'm just going to do this additional degree of difficulty one time only. Hello, my name is Adrienne Wong, she, her, hers. I currently live in Banff by way of Ottawa, by way of Vancouver, by way of Calgary. Uh, I am here because I helped organize this event and uh, what inspires me as a maker is connection and digital makes me think of fingers. Oh, and then I have four seconds left, so. Awesome, thank you. Um, so, my name is Sarah Garten Stanley. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, but I also like they. Um, I, uh, I'm from Montreal originally. Uh, I live here in Kingston and in many other spots. Um, I, I said yes to the invitation because I thought Folda was a really awesome idea and I'm really happy to be here. Um, what gets me most excited as an artist or a bridger is actually connection in all its, in all its uh, manifestations. And um, a one word uh, thing for digital um, connection. Hi, you just met me. I'm Michael Wheeler. I'm the artistic director of Spiderweb Show. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm here not only because I'm the artistic director, but I'm also an instructor at the Dan School of Drama and Music here. M my team currently. Changing. Lovely. Uh, you've also met me. My name is Jamie Galoon, she, her, hers. Um, I'm currently coming from Boston, though I was originally born in Minneapolis. Um, I said yes to the invitation because, uh, because it made a lot of sense, because I was looking forward to partner, because I wanted to have this conversation. Um, and I get excited about digital and possibilities for new ways of connection and new forms of work and new f ways of relating to one another. And I will give back some of my time. Sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Ramona Ostrowski, uh, she, her, hers, the producer of HowlRound, so here from Boston. Um, I'm excited about the um, eco-friendly possibilities of digital technology. And uh, digital makes me think about being connected with my friends. Hi, I'm Vijay Matthew, he, him, his, and I'm from Boston. I'm with the HowlRound Theatre Commons. And what gets me excited is new models and um, new models for, um, for social production. Sure. Hi, I'm Noah Sullivan. Uh, I am here helping out with some audio stuff this morning. Uh, I go by he, him. And I am very excited about the possibilities of audio in digital technology. Thank you, and now back to the circle. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Milton Lim, uh, he, him. I work with the companies Hong Kong Exile and Theater Conspiracy, as well as doing my own work. Um, I am most excited by video games and anime these days. And uh, I came here because I am hopeful that the performance community can be more rigorous about its use of technology as a mode of, of disruption towards traditional models. Uh, computers. Um, hi, I'm Remy Siu. Uh, he, him, his. Um, I also work with Hong Kong Exile. Um, I'm also here with Theatre Replacement to do uh, mine, um, which is why I accepted the invitation, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, what was the question? The oh, what inspires um, all the different ways that you can work um, and constantly have to change working. Um, and one word for digital, I guess, is uh, um, difficult. 
Hi, I'm Kevin Cunningham. I'm the artistic director of Three Legged Dog in New York. Uh, he, him. Um, uh, what inspires me about uh, digital production is um, the way it deepens collaboration and expands scale. And I guess uh, integration would be my word for tech. Hi, I'm Jenny Balasubramaniam. I'm uh, based in New York City. I'm a resident artist at the Public Theater and the Department of Astrophysics, the Museum of Natural History. Um, I'm excited to be here because I'm specifically interested in how digital technologies can be used to invite people into the story of theater who have not um, been allowed in the story of different kinds of theater in the past. Um, I, what inspires me is all the badass scientists that I work with every day. And digital makes me think of analog. Hi, I'm Catherine Hamilton. I make work as Sister Sylvester, uh, currently based in New York, but have been making work for the last five years in Istanbul. Uh, I am excited by bringing together the biological and the digital. And uh, digital makes me think of uh, pressure, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, she, her. Hi, my name is Mia Susan Amir. I live in the, in, on the unceded and occupied territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, colonially known as Vancouver, British Columbia. I was born in Israel, occupied Palestine. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am here because, why? Uh, I'm a multiply affiliated artist, educator, advocate, um, who is, uh, here representing Unsettling Dramaturgy, which is a uh, colloquium bringing together Crip and Indigenous artists from across Canada, so-called Canada and the United States. And we're partnering with HowlRound and with Spiderweb Show. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that I'm here. The end. Hi, I'm Abigail Vega, she, her, hers. I came here today from San Antonio, Texas. Um, I'm. Uh, I'm also kind of on the HowlRound. I'm on the HowlRound team, but I didn't work on this convening, so I didn't raise my hand because I didn't deserve any praise. Um, I'm the producer of the Latinx Theater Commons, which is a flagship program of HowlRound, and why I accepted the invitation today, because I'm curious about what other organizers and bridgers, I love that word, um, how they're using um, technology to connect people from really, really disparate parts of the world. And... Um, what inspires me as an artist is time travel. I'm very interested in time travel right now. All kinds of time travel. Um, uh, digital makes me think of an onion. Hello, I'm Charles Douglas. Uh, I, my pronouns are he, him, his. I'm an actor and fight director. I'm from Ottawa, and I'm here supporting Sheridan College's Screen Industries Research and Training Center. Um, what inspires me is the potential for accessibility for digital to make that more possible in our world. And when I think of digital, I think of magic. Hi, I'm John Hilliker and I'm from Toronto and I, I also am representing Sheridan College. Uh, I came here for the conversations. Um, I'm a, originally a film director who uh, came to Sheridan and started a technology research center. So I'm really interested in, in how creative and technology can interact, so I think of digital as, as interaction and empathy. Hi, I'm Craig Walker. I'm the uh, director of the Dan School of Drama and Music, he, him. Um, <clears throat> I'm here because uh, I guess the themes cover a lot of what I find most frightening and most exciting in my, my field. Um, what inspires me is being taken on a mental journey somewhere I have never traveled. And uh, digital makes me think of ones and zeros. Hello, my name is Colleen Renahan. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm here from, from here in Kingston uh, by way of, okay, Guelph, New Brunswick, Winnipeg, Toronto, Vancouver, and Saskatoon originally. Um, I'm a professor here at the Dance School of Drama and Music. I'm a musicologist. Um, and what brought, what brought me here, is that the next question? Yeah, so I'm interested in um, 
uh, vo voice aesthetics, and I'm interested in materiality and relationality um, of voice and ways in which that is disrupted um, and made new in the context of the digital. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Gata Jane. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a research associate at the University of Waterloo focused on VR and specifically making partnerships between creatives and industry and um, researchers around VR and specifically VR storytelling. So I accepted the invitation because my main interest is how you tell stories in new forms and how you translate the deeply personal work of creating something into um, digital forms and specifically 360. Um, and that, I think, the personal spaces of artists is what most excites me. Hi, my name is uh, Nick Bion. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, I am a Toronto-based uh, playwright, um, originally from Montreal. Uh, I said yes because I was very curious about the storytelling possibilities of VR. Um, and that's probably also the thing that I'm most intrigued about right now, specifically about technology. Hi, I'm Rob Kempson. I'm a writer and director. Uh, I'm originally from Kingston, and I live most of the time in Toronto now. Uh, I said yes because I have a show in the festival, and um, I guess I should say yes. Uh, and, it, and also, I like to do things that scare me, and, and being in a room of people who are quite smart with computers scares me a lot. Um, what I find exciting and ex inspiring in my work is always a community, uh, which if you see the show on Saturday, you'll understand more about, but is pretty uh, standard to a lot of the practices that I engage in as an artist. And digital makes me think of uh, unbridled fear, maybe. Uh -oh. um, hi, my name is Jen Stevenson. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm a professor here at Queen's in the Dan School of Drama and Music. Um, I am here because I like being in the room with engaged thinkers. Um, my particular interest at the moment is thinking about uh, thinking about participation and thinking about how digital platforms uh, draw people together and invite uh, invite different kinds of interactivity. Um, digital makes me think of an open door. Hello, uh, my name is Whit McLaughlin, he, him, his. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm the artistic director of New Paradise Laboratories that's been doing uh, digital uh, performance since the uh, 2009. Um, I'm, I came because I really feel isolated in the digital workspace. Um, I don't actually enjoy it. Um, I'm inspired by varying models of space and time, which I think makes me uh, a science fiction buff. Um, the uh, thing, th the single word that most comes to mind uh, is fragility. Um, last. Hi, my name is Chantal Bilodeau. I am a playwright and the artistic director of the Arctic Cycle. I use she, her, hers, and I live in New York, but I'm originally from uh, Montreal. Uh, I am inspired by people who do things uh, that I can't do, um, or who do things that I do, but much better than me. And um, I did, the one word for digital would be, uh, actually it's two words, social movement. Hi, I'm Maiko Yamamoto, and um, I'm one of the artistic directors of Theater Replacement. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, I came here from Vancouver. Um, I'm here because we also have a show in the festival, and we're very happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, what inspires me are people and my, the, collabor the collaborators I get to work with, and also um, changing the way in which we understand and tell stories. Um, when I think, what word is, is digital? Clocks. Uh, I'm Connor Wiley, uh, he, him. I am here with Theater Replacement as well. Um, I am inspired by the ability to work uh, with flexibility in regards to scale um, using digital technology, which is often challenging in the theater. Um, so the word that I would use is scale. Hi, I'm Sophie Traub. That's my voice now, wow. Um, and uh, my pronouns are she, her, 
Uh, I also like they, them. And I'm from Toronto. Uh, I'm here with or on behalf of Toaster Lab. And I also run an arts organization called the School of Making Thinking. And specifically, I've been running for the last three years a, a 360 video creation residency in North Carolina with them. So um, I'm really excited to bring some of the conversations back to that work. Um, what inspired or why I accepted the invitation, um, I was sort of required to come on behalf of Toaster Lab, and I'm very glad that I got the opportunity. Um, what inspires me is the political, the possibilities for social change in the political decisions that are made around the kind of, um, yeah, as the invention, okay, done. <laughs> it's inspiring. Hi, I'm Trisha Baldwin. I'm the director of the Isabel Bader Center for the Performing Arts. And I have been really inspired this past year by the Eva Goyen Ear Witness Project, um, Lisa Jackson's Bitaban Project, and visiting Ars Technologia in Linz and having great conversations with Michael. So when I think of digital and technology, I think adventure. Hello, my name is Wesley Taylor. I am from another part of the Anishinaabe expanse on the state side um, called Detroit. Um, I also work in Richmond, Virginia as an assistant professor at Virginia Commonwealth University. I was not invited, I asked. Um, <laughs> How Round said yes. And I'm here because I have FOMO. Uh, <laughs> and so things that excite me are being a professor, a new generation of artists and makers, also the prospect of me being able to make into my 80s, 90s, maybe 100, that's exciting to me. Um, two word, one word, Skynet. Good morning, my name is David House, and I am from Boston by way of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I co-lead the Office of the Arts at Emerson College where HowlRound lives, which is why I'm here today. I'm inspired by the work that HowlRound does and we have a fantastic team and the possibilities of more, working more closely with SpiderWeb is uh, exciting. Um, I'm inspired by those who are much more knowledgeable and uh, wise about digital technology and inspired by what I would learn and take away from here. And this is the last thing I will say, that digital makes me think about the opportunity. Uh, my name is Cynthia Ling Lee. I use she and they pronouns. Um, I'm here because I love HowlRound and I was curious. I am inspired by art that moves us towards liberation and reminds us of our capacity for play. What's the other thing I was supposed to say? Hmm? Exciting. Exciting, didn't I just say that? Um, zip, zing, zing, zing. Okay. <laughs> I'm a dancer. <laughs> and I get to follow Cynthia. Great. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Sage Crump. I'm a member of Complex Movements. Um, I live in New Orleans, Louisiana. We are a Detroit-based um, uh, artist collective. I, uh, we invite, uh, took, accepted the invitation um, because HowlRound is one of the only places that I feel like writes about our work and gets it. Um, and also the opportunity to live inside this idea of theater um, because so often our work, people want to create new words. And if we stay in this realm of theater, we get to live into the legacy of like the Free Southern Theater or Carpetbag Theater or all the amazing theaters that have uh, created work that impacts the world in which we live. I'm inspired by people who wake up every day, look at the world around them and try and make it better. And I'm excited by the way our work supports their ability to do that. When I think about digital, I think about the matrix. Did I do it? Did I do it? Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alex Palmer. I go by pronouns uh, she, her. I'm a, an audio artist and theater maker, and I'm here uh, today with Red Dress Productions. I'm originally from Puslinch, Ontario, and I've lived in uh, London, England, and I'm currently in Toronto. Um, why I accepted an invitation to come was because I want to learn. Um, as a bridger or art maker, I'm inspired by relationships. And let me, oh yeah, when I think of digital, I think of breathing and not breathing. Hi, my name is Tristan Whiston. I prefer he, him pronouns. 
I'm here uh, as the co-artistic director of Red Dress Productions with Anna. Uh, we're presenting May I Take Your Arm, which was the invitation, um, which we said yes to, and I'm really happy we did. Um, what inspires me um, is stories, I think, primarily, and um, the digital possibilities of uh, just as another tool of, of, or many other tools of telling stories and helping to have, uh, I also really like layered things and sometimes digital technology can help with that. Uh, when I think of it, I also think of doors, but I think of it as open and closed and smacking me in the face. Thanks, Tristan. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Anna Camilleri. I'm here by way of Toronto. My pronoun is she, her. Uh, I'm, a, I'm happy to present work with Tristan and Alex and Katie Yaland uh, during this festival. Uh, I accepted the invitation because I'm curious. I'm not sure how I fit, even though digital uh, is part of our work. Um, so really, I'm here out of curiosity. I'm interested in the relationship between stories, materiality, and the um, intangibly material, if that makes any sense. And when I think of digital, uh, the colors blue and red come to mind. Temperature, falling, rising. Hi, I'm Andrew Burke. I am from uh, the Mi'kmaq Shibukto, the Great Harbor, Halifax, and I'm mostly he, him. And I and took the invite, invitation here because I worked uh, last year with Halifax's Zupa Theater on this big project called This Is Nowhere. I'm a software developer, and I used to have an arts background, but then I ended up getting, you know, regular boring work. And uh, last year I discovered you can actually do this, like art stuff. Uh, so I'm really excited to be back into doing and learning about all of that kind of thing. And uh, what inspires me about digital is, especially these days with mobile devices and things, the ability to sort of layer other worlds on top of the regular day-to-day -day world. Either that's historical, oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> Hello, my name is Corbin. I'm the managing producer of Theater Replacement. We're here with mine. Um, I was born a settler on the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Um, he, him, his. Uh, when we were making this show, when Michael was making the show with her, the company, uh, we were like, oh man, I hope we get to go to Fulda with this. <laughs> and uh, then we got asked, and so we, uh, that's why we accepted the invitation, which we did with great enthusiasm. Um, uh, my, my inspiration words are paradigm shift, and my digital word is frustration. Hi, my name is Brenda Baker Harger, uh, she, her. Um, I'm here by way of Carnegie Mellon University, which is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in case you were wondering. Everyone heard of Carnegie Mellon, nobody knows where it is. Um, my background is a theater director slash improviser, and I now teach in a graduate program that combines art and technology. So I use theater techniques to invent new things and. Uh, teach students how to collaborate cross-discipline. Um, I accepted this invitation because of all of you. Um, I want to have this conversation and I want to share ideas with people who, who get it. Um, uh, what inspired... I'm sorry. Uh, David Saltz, um, he, him, his, uh, from uh, the University of Georgia uh, in Athens. Uh, I'm a professor and department head there, but originally grew up in Detroit and have lived on both coasts in between. Um, I accepted the invitation because my work as a director and a scholar and a teacher uh, has focused for the past 30 years very much on digital technology and its application to theater. Um, and I'm uh, super excited to, uh, to hear about the work that you guys are doing, both as, as practitioners and your ideas. Uh, and what inspires me is the theater's ability to create new worlds, new realities uh, to, as a laboratory, and, and computers do precisely the same thing. Um, yes. Hi, I'm Tali Hinkis. My artist name is Lovid. I am coming here from uh, Long Island, New York. And uh, she, her. And uh, what brought me here, I'm actually a media and visual artist, and I do work in some performances, but I really wanted to learn and hear more from people in the theater and performance world. Um, 
Uh, what inspires me is uh, big collaborations uh, and a big open process. And instead of a word about digital, I would say that digital is not enough. And the way I think about it is technology more broadly and electronic art or electronic system. There's more than binary, even in technology. Um, hi, I'm Mio Matreik. Um, I'm an animator, designer, and performer because I perform my own work. Um, based in Los Angeles, um, before that the Bay Area, and before that I grew up in Japan. Um, I accepted the invitation because I was very curious about the conversation that I get to be—I would get to be a part of here and who would be in the room. Um, inspiration: I'm interested in the rabbit holes of play that we as artists get to go down and kind of find our personal ways of defining um, what our work is. Um, digital toys. Um, hello, I'm Kristen McWhorter. I'm an artist traveling here from a residency at Banff. And before that, Los Angeles and Chicago, where I'm based. And before that, Baltimore, Maryland, and Denver, Colorado. Um, I'm interested in the complexity of competitive play and competitive interaction. Um, and I accepted the invitation here because the really talented Adrian Dawes told me that I had to. Um, and I'm super thrilled to be here. Uh, digital makes me think of skins. Hi, I'm Stephanie Lind, pronouns she, hers. Um, I'm a faculty member at the, here at the Dance School of Music uh, at Queens uh, by way of Vancouver, Waterloo, and Northern Ontario. Um, I'm a music theorist by trade, so I appreciate the glockenspiel. <laughs> um, and uh, looking at specifically uh, uh, music and culture in video games. Um, I'm excited about teaching and I accepted the invitation because I'm always curious. Digital makes me think of culture. Hi, I'm Wayne Ashley. I'm the founder and artistic director of Future Perfect. We are an interdisciplinary creative studio, uh, very interested in the contradictory outcomes of and the futures of live performance. Uh, I My pronouns are he, his, him, but I'm open to other kinds of pronouns, so I'm interested in exploring that. Um, uh, I, was in, uh, I accepted the invitation here because we're in the process of thinking about new language and um, evaluating our goals and missions uh, for our studio, and I thought this would be the perfect place to meditate on that. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Xander Seren, um, he, his pronouns. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, here together with Wayne Ashley, as a part of Future Perfect. I'm the co-artistic director. I'm also a software developer and computer musician. Uh, why I accepted the invitation uh, we're interested in the shifting futures of live performance and uh, digital as a part of that conversation and interested in hearing what the kind of current rhetorics are around digital. Um, uh, what was the next thing? Uh, what inspires me is uh, uh, contradiction and tension and digital makes me think of uh, hyper-capitalism and control. Hi, I'm Kristen Merting, she, her, hers. I'm from New York City by way of Birmingham, Alabama, which most people don't know about me. Uh, I'm a director of multi-genre work. I'm the founding artistic director of HERE and a co-founding director of the Prototype Festival. Um, my interest, the reason that I wanted to come here is because of my interest in dialogue around these issues, because this type of work is at the intersection of my personal practice and my producing uh, main area of work. Be and it feels to me like the most potent way to address the social justice issues um, through performance today. Uh, and my digital is community. Hi, I'm Kate Bergstrom. I uh, go by she, hers pronouns. I'm here via LaGuardia Airport in New York, uh, Providence, Rhode Island before that, and born on Chumash territory in Santa Barbara, California. I'm an intermediate director and performer and a professor at RISD and NYU, now no longer the new school. Um, I am, I've accepted the invitation to meet all of you and commune and hopefully be surprised and uh, excited by what could be next. 
I am inspired by the possibilities of joy as a radical act in this space and in theatrical spaces. And digital makes me think of expansiveness and the unknown. Hi, um, my name is Anshuli Felicia King. Uh, I go by Felicia in English-speaking countries. Uh, I'm half Thai, half Australian by way of New York. I'm a multidisciplinary artist and my day job is being a playwright. Um, I am interested in finding new dramaturgies for emerging technologies and using them with formal rigor. And digital makes me think of liminality and global potential. Hi, I'm uh, Adam Cooper Tehran. Um, pronouns are them, they, and from uh, Tonotam land of Arizona, Tucson. And I said yes to coming because uh, I'm interested in cross pollinating and connecting with a greater community of artists working in this capacity with technology and performance art. And I'm really excited about storytelling and how that can evolve spaces and alter perceptions of reality and challenge different narratives that might be more um, predominant or in power and destabilizing that. And when I think of digital, I think about cats. Hi, I'm uh, Sean Kerwin, uh, she, her. I'm a set and costume designer and I teach in the Department of Theater at York University. Uh, I wanted to come because I've been aware of the work that Spiderweb Show has been doing for a while, which, and I have been uh, full of admiration for it and I wanted to spend time in the room. Um, I, what inspires me? Uh, trying to find hope in a difficult, troubled world and trying to understand the value of theater in being able to uh, help maneuver that world. Um, digital makes me think of overwhelmed. <laughs> Hello, my name is Sylvia Defend. Um, my pronoun is she. I'm from Toronto. I'm a theater costumer and I teach at York University, theater technology. I'm here today um, because I know nothing about this, and I thought it would be a really interesting um, opportunity to learn more about the digital approach in performance. I'm inspired by learning and collaboration, and when I think of digital, I really think of endless possibilities and exciting possibilities. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, I'm gonna draw our attention to some of the people over there. Bonjour tout le monde. Um, mon nom est Claude Schreier. I work at Canada Council for the Arts in Ottawa. So I'm here um, because I was invited to observe the festival and we're in a partnership with the National Arts Centre on a project on theatre and climate change and I think some of that work's going to be shown here next year. Um, I'm an auto artist as well and I've used technology most of my life. Right now I'm looking at those wind um, engines out there and I'm thinking a lot about sustainability and I'm interested in how uh, technology and the arts can uh, make us not a more sustainable world but a truly sustainable world. It's nice to be here. Hi, I'm Warren Olansky. I'm the uh, president of uh, Planck, um, he, him. Uh, I'm from Montreal and uh, I'm here mainly because I we've been working with uh, Volda for a couple of years now and I wanted to be here to observe and learn about arts and culture, which is our personal passion as a company. Um, and digital makes me think about my team. Hi, I'm Roy Surrett, um, director of Certified, one of the shows in the festival, and the artistic director at Touchstone Theatre in Vancouver. I go by he, him. Um, I'm inspired by, I've always been inspired by HowlRound and uh, Spiderweb and the people and the communicative skills that they bring and I thought that would be, um, it would be great to um, participate. Um, access, digital access, discovery, hurdles, glitches. Hi, my name is May Antaki. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm part of the HowlRound team, um, but I'm based in Toronto and I'm from Montreal. Um, I'm going to be writing a report at the end of this convening. Um, so we're just going to be like taking in what people are saying and what happens. Um, I'm inspired by the exchange of ideas and learning from other people uh, what they're doing, what they're creating. Um, and when I think of digital, I think of screens. 
Thank you very much, everyone. I think that's uh, it for the introductions. And I think it's over to you, Jamie. Is that right? OK, great. Um, so I'm going to just briefly talk about how our first session of the day is going to work. Um, so uh, this format, we're going to have a series of inner circle conversations um, ringed by an outer circle. And this format is um, inspired by and adapted from uh, the work of David uh, Baum, who's a theoretical physicist, um, and the work he did on dialogue. Um, HowlRound, since we, since we were founded in 2011, have used um, different versions of this methodology to try and encourage conversations like these. Um, we have found that um, it can help get get us very deeply into conversation quite quickly and can allow for a multiplicity of perspectives to emerge. Um, so I'm gonna talk through a little bit of what the actual functional format is so everyone has a sense of what's gonna happen. So uh, in this next session, the first 20 minutes or so, we are gonna have an inner circle of six folks uh, which will move our chairs. And these six folks are going to be in conversation with one another. Um, these folks know who they are. We've had a conversation. Um, and, and they're really going to um, uh, provide some reflections, have a casual conversation with, with one another that will then yield um, uh, with one another. The role of the outside circle, so everyone who's not in the inner circle, we call this the listening circle. So this is not the time to sit back and check your email. Your role here is to really listen to what's being said in the inner circle and what isn't being said. Um, what are the other perspectives that need to emerge in response to the prompt that is being offered? Um, so after 20 minutes, we will expand the inner circle to a second circle. We will add six new chairs, and those who feel moved to add a perspective to the conversation will then be able to opt themselves into this second circle. We'll have that same format for about 20 minutes. Um, people can move in and out, so similar to a long table format, you'll be able to tap in um, if you want to join that circle or if you have something to offer and you feel now you are, you've offered what you have to the conversation, you can also step back out. The last 20 minutes of the conversation will be a full circle dialogue. Um, this is a bit of an, ex this exact setup is a bit of an experiment today. Um, so we may learn things in this first session that um, we may actually adapt future sessions based on what we learned. So thank you for your support in us um, trying this out right now. So, okay, great. At this time, I'm going to ask um, Kristen, David, Cynthia, Milton, and Remy to take their chairs along with me and set up along these spike marks for the inner circle right here. I'd also ask that the other mics be brought to the center of the room. Thank you. Oh, Sarah, we thought maybe we wouldn't do that and I would just bring them in. I think it might be. No, that's okay. Sarah just started double chairing. Oh, well, we can. Okay, let's do it. We're going to do, we're gonna do a double chair. We'll just do it. Yeah, trust us. We're going to do double chair. Can I give you a mic? <laughs> oh, I get the pink oh, one. Over there. I think Milton's starting, though. Yeah, um, we should have more. more. Yeah. Thank you. And your second one. Here. Okay. Ah. How many bears? Oh, thank you. Okay. So here we are, and I'm going to ask folks who are understandably grabbing a coffee to, uh, you know, grab what you need quickly and make your way back to the circle. But we will get started. Um, so this session is 
digital and performance in the here and now. Um, we are aiming to look at the state of the field, uh, specifically at the intersection of digital and performance. What is happening now? Um, I've asked each person in the inner circle to reflect on the question, what are the current opportunities and challenges at the intersection of digital and performance? And to kick us off, um, I'm gonna ask Milton to share. Each person is going to have up to three minutes here, um, and I will be timing, because I have my phone right here. Am I talking about last year first, or am I going to introduce myself first with those thoughts? Combine those thoughts. Okay. Yes. Okay. Milton can have a little of my time. <laughs> now? Yeah, so res yeah, you can introduce yourself and respond to the prompt, and feel free to bring in thoughts as they relate to that prompt. Perfectly. Great. Uh, yes, yeah, so from where I sit, what is the state of digital and the performance field? Um, I wanted to break that down to three separate things. So like nationally, I feel like there's in Canada significant separation uh, between uh, digital and performing arts. Um, and mostly that's because of a uh, big gap in financial structures of the not-for-profit uh, sector. Um, but I do feel like it's also, also a big funding priority. Uh, but there are a lot of people who are also not part of the conversation that really should be and people that leave for the for-profit sector. Um, uh, I will also go to Vancouver, the city which I'm from. Uh, my peers and I make systems for performance that often use digital technology to construct visual and sonic architecture questioning agency and presence, often with smaller teams, sometimes with technology in the place of another human. Uh, and we draw heavy inspiration from video games and allow that to change the kind of work we make. Uh, and personally, I look to digital as an expression of communication and as an additional outlet of labor um, within the changing landscape of the attention economy and as a growing conversation of spectacle and performance. Uh, so last year, uh, it was this is the second year of Fold, uh, Fold A, Fold A. Um, and yeah, I think uh, Lisa Marie de la, uh, Liberto, Jiv Parasaram, and I were asked to lead the final closing discussion of last year's forum, uh, following some looming questions about what the festival is and what are, is, uh, what are the objectives of the festival. And there were some big questions if this gathering should be a festival of works, a forum of ideas, or a symposium of sharing research and practice. Uh, because we felt last year with the huge schedule and the very ambitious scope of, um, of the programming, that the panels uh, sometimes let in conversations that uh, led back to similar patterns of engagement within other performing arts festivals. And we were all kind of pining for a little bit more specificity as to what digital means in the performing arts, and specifically uh, trying to find ways to include disruptive kind of formats that radically change the kind of work that we make, rather than augment the kind of work that we already do. Um, so there were desires to see, and I'll just list them off until my time runs out, uh, tech demos and new technologies, uh, both proof of concept works and conceptually rigorous works, links between what we are seeing and what we are learning, a marriage of independent artists and the industry, uh, a place of upscaling or leveling up, as some people said, uh, and from the theater practitioner standpoint, uh, placing art and the unknown at the center, so listening to designers, of which I have to admit there were very few last year. Um, and so I hope this year we can make a concerted effort in being very specific about our approach to digital rather than just talking uh, very generally about it um, and making space for truly disruptive kind of uh, ideas about how art functions with uh, digital technology. Um, insofar as our approach to live performance, what is live, that is maybe not necessarily predicated on physical proximity, time, and tangibility. Thank you. Uh, so around this question, I thought about, first I was thinking about all the different things that people are doing today. The use of green screen to create alternate spaces, games, integration of audience info into projects, video as a character, um, video as back, I was like, am I already done? Video as backdrop, long distance collaboration, live feed, movement, sensor triggers, augmented reality, performer created, um, audio melded, Dramaturgical use of tech to shape narrative, immersive VR, location-based interactive, non-linearity, more easily facilitated communication, formation of community, open source. I just feel like there are all these different ways that, that was just a small list that I was thinking about of all the different ways that the people in this room and that nationally and globally that people are working. And when I think about the challenges, I was thinking about how, 
how we use tech to connect on a human and immediate emotional level is the biggest challenge um, and the greatest opportunity. Um, I was thinking about that Complex Movements article that was um, published by HowlRound this week um, about using technology in a way that's not too surveillance heavy or um, not too accessible, um, not too inaccessible resource-wise. Like that idea is really at the core of how we make this something that speaks to larger groups of people and communities that might not have access and might not think that they're invited into the conversation. Um, and then in my own work, a thing I've been thinking a lot about is our privacy and the erosion and commercialization of our identities online and how that relates to this work. Um, so those were things that I was thinking about as challenges. In terms of opportunities, I think it's uh, alluded to already over here too, uh, the prevalence of tech in people's hands and the extensive use of social media. We have access points that we didn't have before as artists. Um, and how we can use those access points responsibly and in a really uh, communal and inclusive as opposed to invasive way is a really interesting opportunity because it gives us access to multiple stories from multiple perspectives um, in a truly like way where we can remove privilege from that. Um, so that seems like a really amazing opportunity right now. Um, the energy and interest in game theory and game principles for creating interactive, inclusive spaces that people are willing to engage in as opposed to feeling like they're going to be um, that stage of immersive work where people were afraid of what was going to happen to them. But by using the game theory and game world, people will feel more comfortable to come into the space and invited to come into the space in a way that they understand. Um, and then lastly, and it's kind of tied into the previous two points, the opportunity for the dramaturgical impact of the use of technology on how we tell stories and on the new forms that are gonna bubble up as a result of that. So those were my like opening thoughts. All right, so I uh, took this opportunity to reflect on the, the question of the challenges and opportunities of digital media by thinking back on when I started out working with these technologies uh, in the early 90s and the differences between that time and this time, which, in thinking about it, are in many ways completely radically different. The whole universe has transformed, but in other ways, remarkably the same. And in some ways, it sort of surprised me as I thought about it, what hasn't changed. So to start with, briefly, uh, what draws me, what's always drawn me to digital technology is my uh, passion for live performance and the capability of digital technology to become live, to be interactive. To, to, um, so it's not simply uh, sort of canned media that the performers have to adapt to, but it becomes an active player, participant, uh, and through participation can draw um, spectators into performance and create you know, fully interactive events. Uh, so one uh, really obvious and huge difference is that now digital technology is ubiquitous um, and widely accessible to most areas, but there are still some excluded areas. Uh, but these days, bringing a laptop a into a, a theater and hooking it up to a projector and filling the entire space, even using multiple screens, is simply not out of reach for even um, you know, community theaters, not to mention uh, university and professional theaters. Uh, so you can do all sorts of wonderful, subversive work in all different sorts of spaces with this much more easily and inexpensively than you could in the 90s. And an even more exciting potential is uh, in the 90s, we were working with sensors and actuators, and most of this was very inexpensive shoestring, and so the, sort of the current maker culture is very much part of that continuing in that vein. But these days, everybody, again, not everybody, but many people throughout you know, many, many countries and many economic classes are carrying around these amazing devices that have sensors built right into them, easy to use, cameras that you can use not just for cameras, but as sensors, uh, wonderful screens, animation, GPS connectivity, internet connectivity. It's unbelievable what this amazing device can do. Um, and so that's a huge uh, possibility for artistic, creative, political, social activist uses that has barely, the surface has barely been scratched. And um, this gets me to a difference that sort of surprises me. Uh, and that's that the tools that are now available for people to create performance, creative performance and artistic and installation works using digital technologies um, really have not gotten any easier 
to work with uh, in the time, and in some ways they've become even harder. Um, there are the tools for creating canned video, it's basically exactly the same use of, of film and sound that people were doing with analog reel-to-reel, -reel, or you know, back in the article that I posted in Halloran back to, to 1914, or you know, to Scotter in the 20s, and Svoboda in the 50s and 60s, the sort of work that they were doing uh, is exactly the kind of work, except most people these days aren't nearly as creative or innovative in creating interactions with the canned video. But they're using computers to cue, using like QLab and, or expensive media servers just to cue canned sequences. Great. Uh, but if you really, am I done? Yeah, okay. I'm gonna pause So you hopefully there. in the future we'll be able to get, so, so the new technologies are just as harder to use. Hi everyone, um, I, my name is Cynthia Ling Lee and I just wanted to express my gratitude for being here on Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee land and actually just to remind us of some of the really salient points that Adrian brought up at the beginning of our circle. Um, I wanted to briefly position myself. I'm part of a collective called the Postnatium Collective. We are transnational web-based collective of artist activist scholars who are all trained in South Asian dance and for us free and inexpensive technologies have offered a way for us to connect over the past 11 years despite being financially under-resourced. Um, and our urge to connect and collaborate long distance has been a direct response to being marginalized aesthetically in our home communities, which um, inflects everything I'm about, about to say. So when I think of opportunities and challenges around digital technology, I'm reminded on the one hand of the power of technology to galvanize resistance, such as in Black Lives Matter's use of social media, and to make survival possible for the vulnerable, such as the centrality of cell phones for Syrian refugees. And on the other hand, social media can just as easily be used for bullying, advertising, spreading misinformation, and technology has often been used to divide the haves from the have-nots. Which leaves me us with the following questions, which are quite related to what Kristen articulated as well. How can we use digital technology to connect marginalized communities and artists to work towards equity. What is artistically possible and exciting with widely accessible free cheap technologies? And how can we create collaborative inclusive spaces that connect us and allow us to celebrate and acknowledge our differences? Uh, I'm, my name is Remy. I guess I introduced myself earlier. Um, and to kind of talk about these, this question, again, I'll repeat. Is it getting quieter? Okay. From where you sit, uh, what are some current opportunities and challenges at the intersection of digital technology and performance? Um, I'll start, I think, with the opportunities that I at least see for myself. I, I should say that maybe that I, uh, my background is in um, composition, music composition, um, but then having worked over several years in either um, theater and dance that I found my way into um, doing kind of new media work and um, now do that kind of primarily, but also still write music. So um, but, so if, if some of these, I might be using music key terms that if you need to know, if, please just say that, I don't, I don't know what that term is. Um, but a lot of opportunities for me is um, I, I find that I can, because I'm working with uh, making these systems for performance, um, it's, I get to disrupt a lot of processes that, um, that I, and workflows and kind of infrastructures. Um, and a lot of it just stems from the fact that uh, from a decision to kind of re-examine what this score object is, at least in, in music, if I were to think about it as a score, as a fixed medium, um, even if there are, like, say, chance materials or aleatoric content, there it still takes. Pl it's still mostly written on paper, which is, I would say, a fixed medium. Um, and f so, for me, it's it's um, uh, it allows me access to a lot of new formal ways to kind of reflect the world that we live in and kind of systems that are currently. Um, uh, yes, to speak about systems and policy in ways that I think that were not uh, possible before. Um, and so, let me go through here. I like the fact that even re-examining just the score object um, and kind of re-examining what set, 
course, sadness, uh, we should say, the things that are sad, um, already something very simple like this, like, and you play it out with um, the means that we have now, uh, definitely challenge a lot of the infrastructure that, that, that is in place for either theater or music, whether it's that an orchestra is used to just rehearsing with you for like, I don't know, 10 minutes, <laughs> but, uh, or if, if you only have like a day to set up in, in a theater, um, and other things like this, there's like immediately um, infrastructure questions come into play. So that's another big obsession of mine is infrastructure. Um, I guess that's a good way to seg into challenges. Oh, <laughs> infrastructural challenges, yeah. <laughs> Um, I guess I'll say one last thing in challenges. I'm worried that technology or some kind of thing is a fresh coat of paint for something that's really rotten at the bottom. And so I'm always worried about seeing things like some stuff with the, I don't know, the first thing that pops in my head is like, oh yeah, there's an orchestra playing and then there's like some projection stuff at the back and it's the same old stuff. Um, but they're trying to get people to come and they're spending a lot of money to do it. When I think the reason people are not coming is a lot more at the bottom, so, yeah. Thank you all. Um, so we're gonna spend the next five-ish minutes. Just uh, would love to hear you know, what landed on you, what, what things are you thinking about um, based on what your uh, fellow circle members shared. Anything you wanna riff on? I'd like to, uh, so your, your comment that you were ending with is actually, I feel, touches very much on what I was talking about too, is, is using the technology as window dressing, not to radically question anything or, or to explore new forms, but simply uh, to uh, repackage and resell what people have been doing forever. Um, and uh, I think, are, are there any more sort of creative uses of uh, thinking about the way the digital interactive technology can really radically challenge the very notion of a score and the relationship between, a, and a playwright or whatever, between a pre-existing work that somebody has performed when you're actually creating and performing simultaneously. It brings in issues of improvisation which some people have talked about. But has that, have you worked with those areas? Yeah, I think I, a lot of it f for me I, I, is that, um, I'm trying to understand the question right here. Having done a lot of interdisciplinary inter-arts work, um, something that, like a, a lot of this window dressing feeling is, is a worry that when you have multiple disciplines in the room, it becomes a super additive process where like what you get is just kind of like, oh, that, that was obvious uh, what you would get on the other end in that sense. Uh, as opposed to every kind of discipline in the room, including either the techno people working in, in digital mediums, um, kind of asking very, difficult questions about their own, at least their presence there, and kind of like, well, what am I willing to not do, or what am I willing to give up so that other mediums have space to do this, or like, it's a case-by-case -case basis, I think, um, where in every uh, project you're gonna be like, oh, am I gonna give up my, um, I'm a playwright, am I gonna not write anything this time, or like, a, I'm a composer, am I not gonna write any music, or, or I don't know, so, something like I, that, those are very basic, but like, Something like I this. I can just pick up real quickly mm -hmm. on that. Uh, yeah, so I think what that makes me think of is this, uh, the topic, digital plus performance uh, convening, that maybe that paradigm, it's not so much the, the separate things, that you've got digital here, performance here, and it becomes additive, the image behind the orchestra, mm -hmm. uh, but actually when you put those together, they fuse, Steven Universe style, if anybody knows that, yeah. become one new, a whole new thing. And how do we make that happen? What processes can enable that? Mm -hmm. I should pass this along to you. Do you want to hear my thoughts? <laughs> I want to hear your thoughts. I mean, a lot of what, so you each talked a very, a, at one point about the disruption that um, in both, you know, a really positive and p potential filled way that, that this technology can bring, but also um, some of the inherent uh, risks therein. I guess I'm curious in our la in our, the last couple of minutes we have in this format to hear about um, 
examples of um, companies, work, people who you feel are uh, making the most of the opportunity side, um, folks that you might want to lift up who are meeting some of these challenges and um, meeting them, uh, yeah, who are meeting some of these challenges. Uh, in just uh, talking about the, the state of presence and time, uh, just uh, for an example, I, I was thinking last night more and more about the Singaporean artist Choi Kafai uh, and his use of shocking, uh, with little bits of electricity, shocking muscles uh, in order to recreate and record certain styles of movement and therefore be able to play it back on half a person's body, on a full person's body, but also to be able to then uh, space out the, the way in which a performance is uh, timed out. So therefore, getting to perform yourself from yesterday, and then the day after, and then the day after, and that there's a kind of iterative process that can arise out of how, how do I record this thing day by day, and do I get a cleaner sample if I'm able to, which is kind of like a, a augmentation, but also, a, I would say, a fundamental disruption of a kind of rehearsal process from a movement-based standpoint. There's an artist whose name I'm blanking on, so I'll share it with everyone later when I look it up, but uh, she is doing a piece that's a low-tech version of that that is a collaboration by mail. So with the prisoner, he writes a movement sequence. It gets sent in the mail, and then uh, the choreographer that he's collaborating with writes the next movement sequence, and together they create a dance, and then that dance gets created um, for a public, and then they're able to send that back to him. And, and so this is a low-tech collaboration that is using communication, but at a different speed. And I think that's a really fascinating way to empower someone who's in a place where they're not empowered um, outside the walls. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, there have been groups like the Builders Association that's been doing amazing stuff. 1927, which is a London-based group, uh, has been doing really amazing things. Obviously, when you talked about the electric shocking, I thought Stellar you know, has been doing that before. Uh, so there is a huge amount of really interesting and very different sort of work that's, that's being done. But not to get to the practical issue, most of these groups um, either are w wonderfully low-tech, because you can actually be low-tech and use the digital technology, or are working with systems like Max MSP um, um, or Unity, you know, modifying Unity game engine, which takes some high-level programming mm -hmm. talents. Great, thank you. I think that's a perfect segue to um, expand out to our second circle. So you may have noticed we have double chairs. We're gonna undouble ourselves. And um, yeah, the second circle has been spiked. Okay, um, so here we are in the second circle, and just a reminder to everyone, this is the moment where um, anyone who's been sitting in the listening circle and feels they want to join this conversation is welcome to come and sit in any of the empty seats. Thank you. Please don't be shy. Um, and uh, we're gonna continue the conversation with uh, adding some new folks into the mix. Also now, since there's more people, we have three mics, please don't be shy. Let's just facilitate this passing amongst us. And so please just be mindful if you're holding a mic and not speaking that you may need to move it around. Great. I'm looking at Michael. I have thoughts. I'm on the, I'm on the pink mic. Um, I was just thinking, uh, listening to this about, uh, and just almost reflecting on being here about one of the, the major opportunities is about presence and how presence, physical presence or non-physical presence is something that's blurring a lot. And there are like um, examples of that in the theater. Uh, I think about um, holograms, like I think the most famous one is the Tupac hologram that as we saw, but, but we've seen politicians in France also give a speech in one city and their hologram gives a speech in another city simultaneously. And so where performers exist in time and space seems to be shifting. And so that's um, the example on the stage. But I also just was thinking about my own life and my, my decision to move here from Toronto about two years ago and how as a theater artist, it was, it's a bit sketchy to like move from a big city to like a small town and like where's your career going, et cetera. And I haven't really felt like the career impact 
and I think it's because of digital. I think it's because we're on Facebook and we're in, we're in all of the platforms that people are on. And when I go back to Toronto, which I do about once a month, everybody seems to know what we're up to. And I don't think like just even from a career perspective, um, my presence has left the cultural centers in a way that it would have 10 years ago. This is my final thought. Uh, hi. I just was really inspired by the conversation uh, you were having and maybe the first comment that I think David made um, around where we are now in technology. And I do think we're in a place where we kind of globally lack vision to what technology is and kind of referencing, kind of contextualizing where we came from in technology. Before we had I, everything, uh, artists, engineers had to be extremely creative in producing systems to, produce, to create work. So that, um, you know, in like music composition, uh, video, um, so that engineering, integrating engineering and art was a part of their practice, a part of their studio practice. And I often wonder, especially talking to younger people, and you know, folks who uh, grow up with a laptop that has the capabilities to do anything, then what do you do with it? Where is your personal touch? And what do we learn? How, what do we think of technology? And my worry uh, within the performance and globally is that we, um, our vision of what technology is, is dominated by, you know, two, three big companies and their idea of what technology is. And generally speaking, we have moved from a utopian place where we saw technology as an expansion of the hu humanity to uh, a platform for entertainment. And I think then that com comes back again to your idea of, okay, what is this, how does this, this is kind of the bottom run place where um, we need to really liberate ourselves from that. We need to encourage um, artists to think creatively with the tools and really like constantly remind people that technology is not just Facebook uh, in the smallest terms. Uh, just like tiny like personal examples, I've done many workshops where I teach people from all ages, all backgrounds, how to solder two components to produce an LED light. And someone here mentioned technology digital as being magic. And you would think this is just a small thing, you know, you put something, it's LED light. But bringing people connected to the simplest things about technology in a way, to me, it also connects them to just the natural world and seeing that technology is an extension of our relationship um, with nature, so. Can I, sorry, I just wanted. Are you about to, to No, you go, that? I was going to, but you go ahead. You sure? Yes. You're like, you said. No, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, so I want to just drop in, in early in our, in our time together um, a question around this, this word disruption, right? And I think we're, we're using it a lot, and I want to, to invite us to think about uh, being really clearly and speaking clearly what we are disrupting and why. Because I think that's really important in terms of the work that we do when we're using the forms that we are. There's that I, I really appreciated this idea of like conceptual rigorousness or rigorousness is that a word? I don't know, but y'all know what I mean. You know, and and how that applies to both like the technology and the skills that we use, but also why we're applying it, where we're applying it, who has access to it, what is it designed to do in the world, how we are reclaiming what is designed to do in the world, or how we are fostering what it was originally designed to do in the world, which we all know is technically not often very good things, um, and really. Um, beginning for, for this gathering and in our practice, if you're not already, like, what are we disrupting? Why are we doing it? How do the resources we use, where do those come from? Like, really taking the time to think about the ways in which um, the relationship between this digital work that we're talking about, digital performance, and its impact on the terrestrial material world that people have to live in. I wanted to reflect on, on I think, actually, something very similar to what you, when you're talking about disruption, so often, uh, with regards to the window dressing sort of comments that were made earlier, we think of digital technology, or I think there is an invitation to think of digital technology as a way to save money, or a way to somehow shortcut something. And I think that's why, when we were in the introduction circle, I, I spoke about unbridled fear. Because I think collaboration through digital technology is really exciting. And I think about all of the meetings that I've had um, in, in non-physical places that have led to eventual physical meetings. And that collaboration would not have been possible without the, the technology present. But uh, I used to work at a, an organization where the leader had on, on their wall, um, do less better. And, uh, and they didn't follow that mantra at all. And, <laughs> 
And in working at that organization, um, what I found that we constantly did was we, we looked at resources as this as a challenge and as talking about um, knowing the limitations rather than working within them, just using them as this like incredible elastic piece, which led to, I think, um, uh, the depletion of human resources, um, the overextension of people, um, and this idea that digital technology might save us all. And so I think where I have a fear is around us thinking of digital technology as a replacement for something, and where I have a real excitement is as digital technology as an augmentation of something instead. And so uh, to the degree that I think there's there's capacity in this room for that conversation to happen in a pretty substantial way, um, I think what I'm excited about, or I guess um, when we talk about disruption, it's actually about true integration rather than replacing or um, siphoning or finding a creative uh, budget solution. Uh, I'll come on top of that one. Um, and can I, sorry, just really quick, I realize a communication strategy, can we just say our names again when we're talking since um, we might not all know each other? Uh, Whit McLaughlin, New Paradise Laboratories. Um, it occurs to me when I hear conversations about the history of digital media, and when I start thinking about what digital media, what we imagine it doing in this extension of the senses, um, it may be useful for us to um, also figure out how to mark and understand the history of media as it has transitioned from non-digital technologies to digital ones, because it's not really that big of a gap. Um, you know, in early days of theater, the body, the voice, the word, um, analog technologies created media through which communication occurred. Really, there's no difference. We're just in enhancing the taxonomy of media and uh, using the digital world. And I think it's important for us to see that. One problem is, is that we, in digital fields, we, we're really not concerned with history. It's kind of like a, 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 an innovation inflation, always, that, that we're trying to sort of enhance and expand upon the possibilities without actually understanding where we've been and where we're going. It's like, what is the next thing that I can do to maybe in, increase or enhance or augment something. Um, so, for instance, we have no way of archiving digital experimentation. Zero way. Um, uh, digital technology is extraordinarily fragile. Uh, I know this because last night at 2 a.m. I received a phone call that our server farm went down and all eight of our digital properties are gone overnight. This is 20 years of work. And we're not sure where it is or how to find it, whether there's been a, an attack. Um, so, you know, we're really inflating air. You know, we just need to understand where we've been and where we're going. Remy? I'm just shocked by the, <laughs> the story. Uh, uh, what, well, is interesting, because you, sorry, you were saying that, um, uh, about augmenting and, and or something about augmenting and replacing, just to kind of pick up on that branch, and also something about like infl inflating, just like, oh, what can I add, what can it do next, or what can it, um, just a funny kind of observation or com comment is that, and this is also, I'm not saying that I, it's just something that has kind of emerged out of some of my own practice, um, is that we didn't, in some of the works that I do now, or almost all the works that I do now, we didn't augment the stage manager or the lighting designer or the sound operator or the lighting operator, we replaced them. Um, I don't know <laughs> about that. <laughs> like, like that's the, most of the time, how that turns out in practice is that we have the, the IATC kind of sound operator and or stage manager and or whoever that's required to be there based on what you're using in the theater kind of sit there and kind of get to, have a chill time <laughs> and get paid, which is good. Um, but uh, again, it's not like, I just wanted to throw that out there. It's like a thing that happens sometimes for, and it's not that I 100% condone the, like, the labor thing about it, but um, um, it's been a challenge kind of thinking about like, well, I can't um, get to work with the lights, get to work with light the way that I'd like 
with the lighting operator, but maybe we can request the lighting operator and they would just still get paid anyways? I don't know. That's a thing that I think about sometimes. Milton. Uh, I, I think there's a kind of keen reflection on, on the contemporary politic of the replacement of labor that is happening using technology. Um, and that the technology as a tool made to make things more efficient seems like it's, it, like it's in one train of thought as a way to liberate us from, um, from, from labor practices, not for displacement, although that is one thing that arises from it, uh, but also to, to free up uh, things that could otherwise be done more efficiently. Um, and so I often think, I mean, Remy and I often work together, and, and the replacement of, uh, of certain positions uh, seems more efficient for our practices. Uh, but I think that one major categorization that happens is what is the industry doing, and then what are we as young artists doing? Uh, there was a kind of uh, talk about are we, are we still kind of tinkering away and making our own systems? And very much so, I think we are. Um, and David, you brought up like Max MSP, and I'll be teaching a workshop in Isadora, that there are systems that we, we do uh, work away at our, uh, on our own time to try and make uh, ways to resituate ourselves within a performance practice, uh, but also commonly working in theater, often I have to uh, negotiate with uh, other roles in the theater and say, like, I could be doing sound and video, but in instead I can just be doing video because someone is already doing sound and then we have to link our computers um, and so there's at least in my practice there's been a lot of added labor because of having to go back into working with tradition traditional industries which I would say is when I bring up disruption I'm often talking about disrupting ways that we already create work um, yeah I'd love to also take up Sage's invitation to think about disruption and in my mind there is, on the one hand, thinking of disrupting systems of power um, that have historically been oppressive towards particular kinds of, of people. Um, but then there's also a, a tradition, at least in the um, practices I've been trained in, of experimentation being associated with disruption, which is associated with whiteness. Um, so like the new and the experimental and throwing away what's been established in the past as being a, a kind of inherent value for me is very, and, and I'm trained in dance, right? It comes from a very white postmodern place. And if you look on the other hand at like the black art dance tradition in the United States, it's not about throwing away and disruption. It's about building upon and honoring our ancestors. And so I'm wondering how we can think carefully about these kind of competing notions of disruption together and mindfully. Um, I, yeah, I have s some thoughts about that. Like, I, here's a proposal that I make to my students here at the dance school, which is that uh, we have had all these design departments. We've had sound design and lighting design, set design, et cetera, added video design at a certain point. And that now with digital disruption, if we want to call it, there's a new design department in performance. And so right from the very beginning, if we think about it that way, then we can be starting to think about these things as artistic tools. And then we also have to understand from a budgeting perspective that we need a, a design budget for those things and for the designer itself. And, and the reason that I propose that to my students is because uh, some shows actually have no sound design, and that's fine. And some shows can have no digital design, that's fine. But, but it gives them a way in where it's from the beginning an artistic choice and something that allows the disruption to be something that's building within the rest of the context of the work of the art. Um, and so, but I think that's a really good point that um, this art form that we all work in has thousands of years of history and, and uh, just because we put some flashing lights on it doesn't mean that it all didn't exist before. So I love this conversation around time. I think a lot about time travel and past, present, and, and future as, as condensed. And I'm looking at my friend across the way, but your name tag is turned around, so I can't say your name. Wit. Wit. I couldn't write it from here anyway. Hi, I'm Sage. And um, <laughs> I've been thinking a lot of what you said, Wit, and I had a, some notes from the first conversation about um, looking at the, our relationship between the past, the present, and, and where we want to go in the future, right? And you were talking about that within digital media. And in the first circle where that hit me most is this conversation around gaming. And I'm about to... Uh, um, 
sort of out my age a little bit, but when I hear games, I think about hand games, like Miss Mary Mac, like a lot of these things, right? And so there's, there's an embedded technology in that, right? There's a, there's a rhythm, there's a physicality, there's a, a, um, a connection, there, there are all kinds of things that are embedded in that. And how do we pull those things through forward? How do we pull that through? And this gets back to like technology as augmenting or as, as an innovation. Um, and so there's like this conversation around disruption, but I think a lot about vision and iteration and innovation and how these things all live together within this conversation. I think that was a ramble, but that's where I landed. And that's my final thought. Somebody tap me out. <laughs> all right. So uh, I'm gonna pick up on, on some of the, the comments about um, the disruptive potential of digital technology in the, in the process of creating theater. So I, I create work in two different contexts. Uh, a lot of my work is totally as an independent artist in my lab doing, you know, in which case I've got total freedom as to how the process works. And then a lot of my work is also in conventional theater settings where you've got the, the different roles assigned. So getting into this labor issue. And I think the challenge there, so that you're, you're talking about creating the new media role which within that process you sort of have to do, and that's the way we've always done it. There's been the media person added to the table, but in the essay that I put on uh, HowlRound, I talk about the different roles that media plays, and when it's really getting, unless you're going to have the, the projection behind the event, so it's just added, it actually necessarily co collaborates deeply or even usurps the role of the scenic designer or the lighting designer. So if you've got interactive, it's a simple example, let's say you just want the media, you've got a tracker, the spotlight is following the performer, the colors change depending on the, the gestures and the motion. So your, your whole piece is, you can have audience members or improvisational events that then trigger different media elements. So it's gonna happen differently every performance. Then you don't have the conventional lighting designer doing the lighting cues. You still need to have a sense of lighting. You still need that expertise, or that expertise could still help enormously, but integral to the process, working from the very beginning with the digital technologies. So I think you really need to have the supple ability to, to innovate the process from the ground up that most theater companies, even you know, uh, subversive theater companies, <laughs> often simply don't have. I, I want to pick up on what you were saying, Milton, because I think it's really strongly connected to this. It, when I was speaking about the sort of the idea of technology as replacement, I don't think I'm specifically thinking about labor replacement, though. Uh, though that's a really interesting sort of perspective on that because it does make me think about how we value um, theater as a profession anyway, and how any of the jobs within theater are valued or not valued based on a professional designation or a community designation, and the way in which that then translates to transactions and money and stuff. But that feels like a separate sort of piece. I, I think I'm more interested in when. Uh, when the digital application or the invention of the digital is, um, Sarah, what's your title in in uh, in, in Spiderweb show again? Creative catalyst. creative catalyst. So when it comes from a place of creative catalyzing, like when it comes from a place of like, like is this an impulse that is led by this is what we want to do for this project, sort of as you were just speaking about a, a like one size fits one model. Um, for this project, we require this kind of approach, design-wise or, or creation-wise or whatever, what is that creative catalyst? And to, to me, that's really exciting. And where it becomes less exciting is if it's like, well, here's the, this is the way that we can make this work within this budget line. And, and when it is led by an impulse that is not about art, um, that's when I get a bit scared. I, I'll out another boss of mine, which is, I guess, what I'll just do now, um, but who, who uh, had a real, uh, a really strong um, affection for applying to a grant and then deciding how to make that grant in some way connect to the work of the organization, um, which was a, a form that I found really challenging to figure out. But once I figured it out, I found it just sort of deeply problematic. Um, and, and problematic because it meant that we ended up doing a bunch of stuff that we had no intention of doing and that wasn't at all connected to what we wanted to do as an organization, but was connected instead to how we could get money to do the stuff that we didn't want to do anyway. Um, and so I guess I, my concern is about the way that that impulse to employ a digital technology or to, in, in some cases, replace a particular person or a form of labor um, related to, is that my time, should I stop? Okay. Um, it, whether that impulse comes from a place of making work or whether that impulse comes from a place of like 
uh, saving money, shortcuts, yeah, I, that's what freaks me out about it. Um, and like we can talk endlessly about IATSE people sitting there doing nothing. Like I got lots of those for you too. But, but I think where I'm interested in digital technology is where it comes from a place of, um, of honest inquiry related to an artistic practice rather than as a way to shortcut an artistic practice that might otherwise exist in another form. Great, thank you, Rob. So we we are going to transition into the full circle, the last circle conversation, and I'm going to ask that we all move our chairs back, and then Kristen, that you um, share your comment from that part of the circle. Yeah, I think uh, just following on that point, I mean, what we're talking about is an upending of process and that the process of art making is different with the integration of technology and that every piece that you're making, however the technology comes into play in the conversation and in the making of the work, means different people need to be in the room in different configurations and that you're finding different methods for telling stories than perhaps you've used before. Um, the project that I'm currently developing has one team that is like, um, creating a database that we're pulling information from of two people, another team that are building um, how that information gets into 25 tablets that are in front of audience members and plays integrated sound that works with singers, and then a video team of two who are taking all of the data and putting it on the tablets and on different sources around the room. And it's been like an incredibly complicated and fun, pro oh, and then there's also two data miners that we work with in the afternoons before every performance. So there's a team of eight people on that project, four different teams that all have their own ways of working that we're trying to integrate. So I just think there's um, one of the interesting opportunities is how we can engage in process and thinking in completely different ways through the technology, um, integrating it. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna kind of come back, I don't know how long ago this comment was made, but um, sort of thinking through um, the platforms that a lot of this technology is built within and how we access um, and build literacy around technology, um, particularly when we think of game engines like Unreal and Unity. Um, and that while there is an immense amount of technical literacy that um, creates pretty significant barriers to working with those, that they're still largely free platforms for a lot of people to use and learn from, and that YouTube um, provides tutorials and whatnot that makes um, some accessibility in terms of working with those, and how that, as a visual artist, um, departs pretty significantly from like the Adobe Creative Suite, um, which creates a financial dependency with a company in order to engage in a creative process. Um, and so, especially around this conversation of, of labor and um, working within teams where uh, we're kind of outsourcing our technical literacy, I think a lot about how, how as creative makers and working within creative teams, we also build space for learning, I guess, um, so that it's not just computer science departments who are, who are building the accessibility tracks to being able to work this way. Um, just sort of an open comment. Thank you, yep. Hi, um, I'm John. Uh, John? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, just uh, picking up on the, the previous two speakers, uh, I, I come from a particular background in, in terms of technology and, and creative, and it, it is film and television. But, but there's a, a lot of similarities, I think. I mean, a lot of the start of, of, of digital, and this is mostly about, about game engines and virtual worlds, and using, using those technologies as a starting point, but not necessarily as, as a final uh, part of the process. So um, as a director, I used to, uh, you know, when I started out using, using digital technologies, it wasn't necessarily to then have digital technologies as part of the end process. It was using them for collaboration, using them for, uh, uh, in real time, being able to work with actors and, and have camera people come in and, 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 and play around and people be able to see things and pe be able to send that to people someplace else. And so whether you actually used digital technologies in, in that same way 
at the end or as part of the process was was not really necessary. It was about the collaboration. So again, it's about to me, it's about the the design process and then figuring out how you want to use digital within that. But it's really about digital for collaboration and for visualization and and that communication that you can have at an early stage. Um, I wanted to, uh, hi, <laughs> I'm Miwa, um, so I'm not sure, I think it was sort of like ideas that were floating around, so I'm not sure like what question I'm answering or who I'm kind of commenting towards at this point, but um, I was just thinking about how it feels like there's sort of a hierarchy of technology and like digital technology in terms of like top keeps getting replaced by the newest tech. Um, and I can feel that when I go to festivals and it's like, oh, like we have this new tech and artists working on this new thing and they're looking for people, you know, like for example, VR a few years ago. Um, and um, I mean, I come from a background in animation. I use technology. I can't make my work without technology, but for my own work, I am making canned performances that are choreographed with tech, uh, with media that I've made. Um, for, with my theater company or with other companies, I have done some interactive interaction stuff, but on my own practice, it's mostly choreographed. Um, and I think there is something to be said that, like, as technology kind of, like, the attention of technology gets replaced with the newest thing, that um, there is something to be said about certain artists who tinker in sort of, like, maybe an older medium, but through that tinkering process and the 10,000 hours can make something that transcends. And, you know, you can say that about, like, craft as well in terms of like even basket weaving if someone has like completely mastered it they can create magic and transcendence and I think it's important to remember that um, um, and I think also that like you know like canned media performances um, it you know in some ways it doesn't involve the tech that the newest technology and like interaction but I think choreography can also be like music and you know, there is something to be said about listening, like listening or watching or experiencing something that feels like a symphonic canned um, experience as opposed to something that is maybe interactive but doesn't have that flow and um, reveal of um, magic. Um, so just that's my thought. Thank you. Okay, we're going to hear Kevin. And then uh, there were some Wesley, Kate. I'm just giving the mic runner some instruction here. So Kevin, Wesley, Kate, I saw Claude. Claude? No. Okay, Claude, but then also, what's her, what's her name? Remind me of your Mia. name, Mia. Thank you, Mia. Claude, then Mia. Okay, Kevin. Oh, okay. So um, uh, we've come up with a couple of different sort of principles or ways of thinking about technology in live performance and interactive work. And two principles that we sort of follow at Three-Legged Dog are, the first one is the art is the boss. So whatever the project is, the team and the way that we approach the work is determined by what the project needs to grow into, right? Not by a departmental structure determined by the history of Off-Broadway theater or, you know, any other um, ex externally, you know, uh, applied um, structure. Um, a lot of times for us, that means there's a, a, a figure in the team that's a production designer, somebody who oversees all the different uh, uh, elements of the design process. Um, but I just wanted to say, for, for me anyway, the biggest sort of effect of technology on my artistic practice since the 90s at least hasn't, doesn't have anything to do with big crazy video, which we do a lot of. And, or holography or any of the effects that the technology produces, but the tools that we use, uh, the nature of those tools is to help integrate the different elements of the production, including live action. Isadora is a good example. It's an inexpensive, very, very powerful tool if you learn how to use it. Um, that's gotten us into some interesting territory recently. We brought, uh, we've been developing an immersive platform uh, an immersive interactive platform that went to Sundance this year. And what we did was we set up a, a mapped room uh, and we invited 40 artists in to work in the room. Uh, it's com you know completely video mapped. It has immersive sound and there are various um, sensor uh, elements in there. But what we did was instead of re revising the system for each artist that came in, is we did an additive process and we built a complex system that included Isadora, Max MSP, uh, Ableton, um, QLab, uh, uh, Unity, Unreal Engine, 
and the system ended up being um, cross-platform, having a box, a computer, and two Mac, uh, Mac trash cans, you know, and uh, HTC Vive trackers and, and Elite Motion. So it was interesting. They all we were able to get them all to work together and to be switchable, so that we could completely reconfigure the system in a five to ten minute turnaround. Right. So. So I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that technology doesn't have to be um, focused on uh, uh, effects. You know, this ba the backdrop video, for example, is pervasive, right? The other track in, in, in digital arts that, that, uh, that I find problematic is, is the one I went to Phil Kneeblock's studio to see a digital musical piece. And we all walked into the studio and the band set up in front of the door so we couldn't leave and proceeded to show us how they played with their toys for three and a half hours. And uh, so, um, but, but, you know, it really is a matter of how you use it. And I think that one of the really uh, interesting opportunities are these integrative tools that are inexpensive and easy to use. Great, thank you. I want to note that we have about five minutes left together. And I would like for us to get through Wes, Kate, Claude, and Mia. So please keep that in mind and hand it over to, to Wes. Yeah, so I mean, I guess I'll make this short. I think, um, Kevin, what you were talking about is really exciting. I feel like as a member of complex movements, we find ourselves in that all the time, um, trying to have certain tech talk to different tech, right? Um, and I feel like We've been able to do it through platforms such as like Touch Designer and things like that that have been able to do crazy things with some of the same software um, you're talking about. Um, yeah, we got Touch Designer in there too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think one thing, and this is, I'll keep it really brief because it's just a thing that I think about, um, especially when the word of like disruption comes up and has been like, I don't know, a hot point, you know, but I think where I get really itchy especially like in creative spaces, is when the ethos and words and certain things are borrowed from, I would say, startup culture. Mm -hmm. um, and so like all of those words like really give me an allergic reaction only because um, I think there are these histories that come up, but I, I don't like my creative spaces to track or parallel some of these cultures. Mm -hmm. um, and just thinking about the things that we borrow and absorb or don't even question when we start to bring these things up, so. Thank you. Uh, Kate. Uh, thanks, I really appreciate what you said and I'll keep it brief only because when I think about disruption, I think about the disruption of corporate hegemony and I wonder about what we are trying to disrupt um, and how, if we're talking about integration of these complex technologies and, and the amount of finances we're pouring into these sort of integrations, we also have to think about learning. And I really appreciate, amidst this like making of magic, thinking about how we are integrating our, our audiences um, with uh, care and uh, purposefully amidst, amidst uh, sort of the obliteration or... Um, the obsolescence of technology, like bringing, uh, bringing technology in as a way of invitation rather than ostracization. Uh, and I just, I, I'd be curious to talk more about that over the course of the day. Hi, um, I just want to mention, people talked a little bit about infrastructure and funding and what I do at Canada Council is, um, well, what I would like to mention to you is that we've invested, and especially for our American friends, we've put a lot of money into critical thinking around digital technology. We've created the Digital Strategy Fund, and we've just launched a project with CBC, uh, a creation accelerator. So there's a number of opportunities for artists to critically look at technology. And I, I really appreciate what Sage said earlier about the notion of disruption, but also um, looking, at, being more aware <coughs> of the tools that we're using um, and not making assumptions about them, you know, that that the amount of energy used, the amount of energy in the production. I, I was with um, Chantal and um, Sarah at a, a summit on climate change in Banff that was quite uh, troubling is not the right word. <laughs> um, but there was a woman, uh, Alison Tickle from Julie's Bicycle, some of you might know in the UK, and, and what they're trying to do is 
get uh, arts organizations and artists to um, measure their impact and to make decisions on how they can have a more sustainable approach to their lives, including use of technology. So I think it's something we should really think about uh, seriously and, and challenge some of our own assumptions that it's okay to do the kind of things we did in the past, it might not be okay. Thank you. One of my greatest curiosities right now stems from what cognitive neuroscience calls co-presence, which is the way in which we somatically entrain when we're in shared space and time, the way our breath rate and our heart rate come into synchronicity. And so everything that we're talking about, the use of these technologies happen on bodies and on brains. And I'm curious about how we're thinking about whose bodies and whose brains these um, technologies are being used to create works for and whose bodies and brains are being engaged in the process of creation. So I'm talking about from a crip perspective, uh, are crip bodies and minds being centered in these creative processes and practices? For the large part, no. And so um, thinking about access and inclusion, uh, really I'm more interested in who's being centered and how are these um, access points being generated or not. And um, similarly, uh, I'm also interested in how the use of digital technology allows us to uh, crypt time or work on alternative time signatures. A lot of the projects that I'm working on right now are really experimenting with the tension and possibility that live inside of um, using technology to connect artists across geographic boundaries. And um, I'm really curious about how do we remain, uh, how do we mobilize uh, fundamentally body and place-based practices through mediums that in a lot of ways displace us? How do we engage emplacement? Um, so those are some of the questions that are coursing through me. Thank you. Um, with that, with that, yeah, is it working? Yeah. I'm going to close us out because we have a hard stop here so that we can get our friends from Prague um, connected. Thank you all so much. This is just the beginning of our conversation today. Um, we are now moving into a break um, for the next 10 minutes. Um, we'll be back at 11.30. Um, but before we start moving, I would ask that everyone actually take your things with you. You can go get coffee right there, hit up the washroom, you can go to the patio. We need to do a bit of a reset right here to get set up for this Prague session. So thank you all so much.